go, go listen to it. Looks like a tent. Where's our, where's our lady behind the curtain? Around the bed. We need us this help. No, we're on. <laughs> Hannah's on. It's on? No, okay. Hers is on. We're on. Her, Hannah's is. One of my favorite jokes is, oh, my computer broke. I call my tech person. And, but I have to wait till he gets home from kindergarten before he can fix it. So <laughs> that's me with technology. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, first program of the year. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple announcements to, uh, to uh, announce before I introduce these lovely ladies. First of all, uh, the scavenger hunt is on again this year. And if you have not done the scavenger hunt, you've got to do it. The two ladies that put that thing together are crazy in the head. <laughs> um, in a good way. In, in a good way. And uh, they, they do a lovely job of, of uh, not only historical things, but fun things too. So uh, think about that. Go on the Cumberland Historical Society website and, and find out all about it. Uh, and that'll be May 17th. And if you're interested, get a team together. And uh, I've got applications up there on the table. Uh, next month's uh, program will be ice cutting with Lyle Merrifield. Uh, he's the owner of uh, Merrifield Farms uh, in Gorham. He's also president of the Cumberland Farmers Club. It's going to be a week early because <laughs> the next week he's going to be in the hospital with a shoulder uh, operation. So uh, be aware of that. And with that out of the way, uh, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Michelle Josephson, who is in school uh, <laughs> with my youngest son and his wife. So I've watched this kiddo grow up and her kids grow up. Well, I don't know if the kids have grown up, but I don't know about her. <laughs> <laughs> and her partner in crime from the Victoria Mansion, uh, Hannah Fields. So let's give them a really warm combo to start with exciting welcome. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, I kind of feel like this is old home days because I think I know at least half of you here. But thanks for coming and hearing about our project. Um, so we are here today from uh, the Portland Bridget Project, which is a research project that uh, Hannah and I have put together. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, we are both affiliated with Victoria Mansion. Um, we're also connected with Maine Irish Heritage Center, which is a block away from Victoria Mansion. I work at Victoria Mansion and Moonlight at Maine Irish. Hannah works at Maine Irish and Moonlight's at Victoria Mansion. So there's a lot of overlap um, within the organizations as a whole anyway. But particularly with us, it kind of blurs together. Um, but the Portland Bridget Project was something that we did independently. Uh, it started a little bit before the pandemic, but really got rolling during the pandemic when everything was closed. So what are you going to do? Hey, let's start a research project. Um, full disclosure that the um, research of the servants, particularly at Victoria Mansion, started with a colleague of ours, Matt uh, Jude Barker, who is an amazing researcher at Maine Irish Heritage Center. He had started this, and then Hannah and I ran with it. So, But we like to give him credit, because he was definitely the one who started this. Um, so how this project got started for me is that, um, for those of you who don't know, my maiden name's O'Donnell, so a nice Irish name. I usually, I usually use it at these things. Um, my great-grandmother was a maid. She worked um, as a maid on Deering Street in Portland. Uh, she actually worked for the um, Portuguese, um, not ambassador, consul, Portuguese consul. Um, however, I couldn't find a whole lot of information about her. And then I was like, I wish I could find more information about her. So then I was like, well, I work at a mansion that had to have had servants. And at that time, we didn't know a whole lot about the servants at Victoria Mansion. So I kind of went down that rabbit hole and haven't come out of the rabbit hole, really, in three years. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. All right. Hannah's going to tell you a little bit about how we got to this point with having so many Irish servants in Portland. Indeed. All righty. So throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, Ireland was experiencing a lot of famines and oppression, um, which led to a mass exodus of people out of Ireland. Um, this culminated with Angorda Moor, which is Irish for the Great Hunger, um, which took place from 1845 to 1852. That's also known as the Potato Famine. Um, this wasn't the only famine in Ireland during, um, during the 19th and 20th centuries, but it was the largest, and it had an immense impact on the country of Ireland and the world. Um, this impact is still seen today um, with an extensive global diaspora 
of Irish people. Um, Ireland lost an estimated two to three million um, people in their population through, during the um, Great Hunger through um, immigration um, and death from starvation and disease. And it's, their population has not recovered to this day. Um, this was a manufactured famine. Um, Ireland was under British rule at the time, and socioeconomic factors forced Irish reliance on the potato. Other uh, crops had to be exported for British use, so when the potato crop failed, it was devastating to Ireland. Um, following the famine, Irish women were immigrating to the U.S. more than women of any other ethnic group, and by the end of the 19th century, more women than men were leaving Ireland for opportunity abroad. Um, here's just some of the many places that the Irish ended up um, over time. Um, like I said, a very extensive global diaspora. So why women? Why were Irish women um, coming to America more than Irish men and more than women of other groups? Um, prior to the Great Hunger, Ireland's agriculture was made up of small family farms. Uh, women were paid and um, paid in unpaid farm labor. That was the predominant work available for women in Ireland, especially in rural areas of Ireland. Goods like eggs and milk gave women something to barter with, and domestic work in Ireland included large amounts of outdoor work. During the famine, policy changes by the British encouraged the, con the cons consolidation of smaller farms into larger, more industrialized farms. Over 500,000 Irish people were evicted from their land during the Great Hunger alone, and these evictions continued following the Great Hunger. This loss of farms brought a loss of opportunity for women, and this coupled with increased hardship that made it harder for families to support multiple children, often only being able to afford the dowry of one daughter. So where in Portland did the Irish end up? Uh, one of the first places that they settled was Gorham's Corner. This is what Gorham's Corner looks like today. You might recognize the <laughs> John Ford statue. Um, John Ford was the son of Irish immigrants and a well-known film director. You might also recognize the Holiday Inn. Uh, so the Irish settled in this neighborhood, um, as well as a few others in Portland. And at the time, they were mostly Catholic and they did not have a Catholic church. Um, they needed a place to worship, a place to call their own, a place of community. So they advocated to the bishop in Boston who sent up a priest. And the first Catholic church in Portland was St. Dominic's. This is now home to the main Irish Heritage Center. Now most of the people who immigrated to this part of Maine, specifically Portland, have roots in, uh, in Galway, specifically towns called Karna and Connemara. Um, I mean, Karna in Connemara and Spittle as well, um, but a lot of Galway connections. It's a good place for people to come from. Indeed. Uh, they faced a lot of discrimination. There was a lot of anti-immigrant, anti-Irish, and anti-Catholic sentiment. Um, so here's just an example of um, a comic that was in a in a magazine that you would see pretty regularly at the time. And I'm going to read this for you because it's very small. Um, it's, on the left, it says, they are evicted in the old country. And on the right, down below, it says, but in America, they do all the evicting themselves. And you might be able to notice some um, interesting symbolism in this photo. You have um, the Irish woman here depicted with um, monkey-like features. She's feeding the Irish policeman um, out of the um, homeowner's kitchen, and she's clearly being very bossy to the homeowner. So um, a lot of negative stereotypes at, at the time um, of Irish in general. Um, the, at this time, immigrants did a lot of the jobs that other people did not want to do, like domestic work. Uh, but life was very different in the US than it was in Ireland, with different social and cook social standards, cooking standards, technology, and even for many a language barrier. Many women would have come from small homes, often with dirt floors, and were used to cooking over peat fires. They had to navigate life in these big houses, learning new technology, new ways of cooking and cleaning, and adapting to a completely different way of living. 
Um, those who immigrated from Irish-speaking regions of Ireland, called Gaeltex, uh, were faced with a significant language barrier. Um, many people from Galway uh, would have experienced this, as it is one of the remaining Gaeltex. For most domestics, boarding was provided, which allowed them to save up and send more money home. Um, Irish women collectively sent hundreds of thousands of dollars home to Ireland each year. And Irish women were seen as more reliable providers for their families back home th um, than Irish men were. <laughs> and one more thing that I think is very important to note is that domestic service here in the Northeast is nothing like you would have seen in Downton Abbey. So as we continue through this presentation, please keep that in mind. Um, we did not have large English manor houses like Downton. So what do we have? <laughs> um, as Hannah and I were doing this research, um, this book is a fabulous book. I happen to have it right here if anybody wants to take a look at it. Um, the Irish Bridget by uh, Mar Dr. Margaret Lynch Brennan. She did a lot of research on what servitude, domestic servitude in uh, particularly New England was like. Um, so getting away from the thought of Downton Abbey as to what the experience was like here in the Northeast. So if you are interested later, I would recommend finding this book. It's a great resource. All right, so when we were looking at Victoria Mansion, um, unfortunately, neither owner of Victoria Mansion left us a list of who their servants were. That would, make, would have made life a lot easier. Um, we had to do some digging. We had a couple names, and, and one was like Katie who cooked uh, soup. I mean, you know, didn't really help us any. We kind of, it happened, she cooked the soup about the time the Portland sank. So, I mean, it kind of gave us a time frame, but it wasn't particularly helpful. Um, so, what sort of resources did we use to find out about the servants? Um, the biggest one was Ancestry.com, which thankfully was free during the pandemic, because I'm a cheap person. Um, what sort of things did we find in Ancestry? Um, we'd take a look at the censuses. Uh, we also looked at city directories. Um, so every, it depends on what time frame you're looking at, but every year or a couple of years, there would be a person who would go door to door to every house in Portland, knock on the door and say, who lives here? Um, he was looking for who are the males who are employed, pretty much is who he was looking for. Um, but sometimes if that person answered the door, maybe was the maid, sometimes the maid's name slipped in there. So sometimes you can see some of the servants that way. Um, we also were looking at, uh, the bottom is a uh, ship's register. So if we've got a name, we're trying to figure out more about them. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute, what we can learn from a ship's register. Um, we also looked at irishgenealogy.ie, which is similar to Ancestry, not as broad. Um, but the nice thing is that they have church records, which church is very important in Ireland, so there was a lot of uh, records available there if, you're, if you have the right towns and they're online. Um, and also their civil records, so we could find out a lot about people who living in Ireland. Um, and the other was newspapers.com. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I know I've talked to some of you about this. Um, the Portland newspapers were not digitized till about three years ago, two, year, two or three years ago, um, which was ridiculous. You could look up every other city and probably in the world, I don't know, except for Portland. Um, and so just a couple years ago, the Portland newspapers were digitized. Like Christmas. It, it was like Christmas. Hannah actually texted me. She's like, is this true? I'm like, no, that's not true. Um, all of us at Victoria Mansion started looking stuff up. It was like they were going to take it away from us. It's like we're going we're gonna to learn all of this stuff today. I barely slept for a week. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, we can look this up. We can look this up. And we did find some fun stuff. Um, and this is just kind of a random example. So um, we're going to talk about Victoria Mansion in just a minute. The address at Victoria Mansion is 109 Danforth Street. So I was just looking at all these sources because I don't have any names. I'm looking at all these sources for anybody who lives at 109 Danforth Street. Um, so this came up. This is a jeweler's ad. Um, and it looks like that they must have had like a weekly drawing, you know, trying to lure customers in, drop your name in the hat, and you might win something. So number six, 760 that I highlighted must have been her ticket number, I guess. Um, Julia Foley at 109 Danforth Street won a butter knife. Um, Foley's a pretty Irish name, <laughs> so um, I am making the assumption that that's a servant. Um, we've been looking more, looking a little bit more, trying to f learn about her. Um, there are several Julia Foley's that are in the city directory, so we got to try to see if we can pin pin it down. But that is by far the weirdest way I have found a servant is that she won a butter knife in 1886. 
All right, so we're going to talk about this place. Anybody ever been here? Oh, good. Oh, good. You can come back because there's lots of different things. Um, so for those who don't know, this is Victoria Mansion in Portland. Um, it was completed in 1860 for a man named Ruggles Morse. Um, Morse was from Leeds, Maine. He went down to New Orleans and got involved in the hotel business. Uh, unfortunately, he also was involved in enslaving people. Um, those were two ways he made his money. But he decided that he and his wife needed a summer home back up here in their home state of Maine. So this is a summer house for two people. Modest little camp. Uh, we're actually going to talk about the second owners of the house, though. Uh, we're going to talk about Louisa and J.R. Libby, and they lived in, moved into the mansion in 1894. Uh, he died in 1917, and she died in 1924. Uh, he, they owned a big department store in Portland along the lines of Porches or Owen Moore, one of those. Uh, it was the J.R. Libby Company. It was the biggest department store uh, in Portland at the time. And like I said, they moved in in 1894 with their five children. And it was their year-round residence, so they started using spaces a little bit differently. Uh, this, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, this is the youngest uh, Libby, uh, Libby daughter, Alice Libby Brown. She was interviewed in 1967 by Earl Shuttleworth. Anybody know who Earl is? <laughs> he was in high school at the time when he did this. Um, so he, ha someone, he, was, he happened to be at the hotel where she was staying, and someone mentioned you should go interview Mrs. Brown. I'm very thankful that he did. Um, this is one paragraph of the article um, talking about a coachman who uh, also polished the silver hinges and doorknobs in the mansion. And the house was staffed with, also staffed with a cook and a maid, so that we're not thinking of Downton Abbey with that massive uh, staff of servants. Right, for, right from a Libby child, they had three servants, so. All right, so also in the newspapers, we found these. These are both advertisements for, um, they're looking for servants to work at 109 Danforth Street, which again is Victoria Mansion. Anybody, anybody notice anything in there? Well, typo, there is a typo. The typesetter was, was probably sleeping or something. But there's something else that the two ads have in common. Protestant. Protestant. So they were pretty, the, the Libbies were very strong Protestant uh, uh, folks, um, they definitely did not want a Catholic servant. Um, you, you hear about no Irish need apply. Th that's what she's saying. The Catholics were the Irish, so, um, and the, the Irish were not Protestants. So without saying, I don't want an Irish servant, she's got it written out right here. And I like the bottom one because it's even got Mrs. J.R. Libby. There's no doubt who's saying that. Problem, though. So these are the servants that we have found that have worked at the mansion. Uh, the ones in green are Irish. Uh, they're all Catholic. The ones in blue are not Irish. Uh, I think they're both Canadian or from Canadian descent. Um, and they are also Catholic. So we've gone from I only want Protestant servants to most of our servants are Catholic. Um, and I don't fully know the answer to that. I can tell you that these advertisements are from the late 1890s. We have not yet found the servants who worked there in that time frame. And if you notice, these are all, uh, with the exception of the coachman, but they are, uh, we're not talking about guys today. <laughs> it's Women's History Month. Um, so most of them were Catholic and most of them were Irish. So you can say that you only want a Protestant servant, but if the only people who are willing to do the work are the Catholics, you're going to get what you get. So most of the servants indeed were Catholic. And they would have gone, as Hannah pointed out, they would have gone to St. Dominic's Church, which is right up the street from us. So the first servant we're going to talk about is Hannah Shine. Beautiful picture. Um, she was listed on the 1910 census as a servant. Uh, she is from the town of Moivan, which is in County Kerry. So I lift that up there. She's the exception to the rule that everybody's from Galway. Not everybody was, but she was from County Kerry. So this is the, the um, ship's registry for Hannah coming in. The top one says that she come, came in on the SS New England that came from Queenstown, which is now Cove. Um, and the person doing the record kind of bumbled it, but it is 1900, June something 1900. Next one is her name, Hannah Shine. She's 20 years old. Um, and this here says she's a housemaid. It's H maid. Again, handwriting? They didn't have Mrs. Small to drill in handwriting in third grade. That's what it was. It's a, if you look at the H of Hannah, it's the same as the H before maid, so it's housemaid. Um, and then below, she came with her sister, uh, excuse me, her sister paid for her ticket. She had $2.50 $2 when she came. 
and it lists who she was going to be living with, and she has her sister Ellen at 681 Congress Street. Um, as Hannah was saying, a lot of Irish women in particular would send money home. That was both to support the family at home, but it also was to send more people over to make more money. Chain migration was a big thing. So this is a perfect example that um, Ellen, she actually went by Nellie. Um, Nellie had sent money home for her sister Hannah to come visit her, uh, to come live with her, excuse me, visit and live with her. This is Nellie. She was, she was a few years older than Hannah was. She came over about 10 years earlier, I think. Uh, this is 681 Congress Street. If I had a picture that went all the way over here, you would see the Longfellow statue. So this is right at Longfellow Square, that State Street coming up. And just a fun fact, so that's where Hannah went and she would have stayed. Um, Nellie was working for a man named Dr. Weeks, who was a well-known well surgeon in Portland. Um, about the time of World War II, excuse me, World War I, when the flu pandemic started up, uh, the Sisters of Mercy wanted to make a hospital to help the folks who had the flu. And so they founded Queen's Hospital and Dr. Weeks' daughter gave their house. So they were Protestant and they were nice and gave it to the Catholic sisters. Um, so this became Queen's Hospital, which evolved into Mercy Hospital. So basically this was the first Mercy Hospital after the time that Hannah and Nellie lived there, but just a little fun Portland history fact. So at the bottom, we have the 19 cen 1910 census, and you see Hannah Schein is listed on the bottom as a servant. And above that, we have Catherine Steed, who is also listed as a servant. Uh, we, we know from other documents she went by Katie, so we, we refer to her as Katie. We feel like we know these people. So this is Katie, who may or may not have been the same Katie, Katie who made the soup. I haven't nailed that down yet, but Katie was a pretty common name. Uh, so Katie was born in, excuse me, Katie was in, um, born in the town of Glenifosha in County Galway, so I've marked that here. Um, and she came over. She worked for a variety of families around the Portland area, and then by 1910 had ended up with Hannah working for the Libbies. And we happen to know that Hannah and Katie were pretty good friends. Um, the middle is Hannah, and then on the right-hand side is Katie. The left-hand side is Katie's sister, Nora. So Nellie, Hannah's sister, and these three ladies were all friends. We have different documents of them uh, together. Um, and actually, when Katie was applied for citizenship, Nellie was one of her witnesses who said, yes, she's a good citizen. So these four ladies were intertwined. The fun things that we find in newspapers, so I found this just randomly looking for these ladies' names. Three Irish maids made the paper because they went on holidays to the mountains. I don't know how that ended up in the newspaper. We don't know. I like to think that maybe this picture was taken when they were on the holiday. I, I don't know. I just think it's an adorable picture and that Nora and Hannah are holding hands and they've got their cute hats and just a fun. But those, they were all intertwined. So speaking of intertwined and speaking of chain migration, uh, there were, so we had Nora and Katie, the Steed sisters. They also had a sister, Margaret. Margaret stayed in Ireland because she was married. But they sent money back for Margaret's daughter, Sabina, to come. <laughs> More chain migration. So this is Catherine's niece. Um, at the bottom is the listing from the city directory. Um, it says that Sabina K. Grady, miss, is a maid at 109 Danforth Street. And then it says, buds dio. That means that she boards ditto. She lives in the same place. So she lived at the mansion. Um, and the K, her name was Sabina Catherine Grady. She was named after her aunt, who at least helped pay her way to get here. Um, and she, not surprisingly, was also from Glenifosha in Galway. Uh, and this picture here is actually the only picture we have of a servant at Victoria Mansion. So that's Sabina on the front steps of the mansion. And she is playing or holding or restraining or something one of the Libby grandchildren, Austin Chamberlain, in 1920. So that's, that's our treasure. When we started this whole servant research thing, that's all we had. The Libby family had given that to the mansion at one point. So that was the only picture we had, and it remains the only picture we have of a servant at the mansion. Uh, Sabina stuck around Portland for quite a long time. Uh, she ended up getting married, and then she was Mrs. Jennings. Uh, she was very active in the social life at St. Dominic's Church. Um, I, I have some church friends in here. We all know the people who end up doing every activity, every Christmas fair, every church fair. Uh, that was Sabina. If there was a bridge club event, whist, or uh, Christmas fair, or strawberry festival seemed to be big, Sabina was involved in that. Um, and one of the articles I found also is... The nice thing about the 30s and 40s is there's articles on everything. Every bridal shower, baby shower, everything. So you start matching names up. So this was a, um, a trip that, so Sabina is Mrs. M.B. Jennings. 
took, she went to New York with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Edward McGonagall. I don't know who they are. But she also went with Miss Catherine Cullinan. Guess what? When Sabina got married, Catherine took her job at Victoria Mansion. <laughs> it's all intertwined. So this is Catherine, Catherine Cullinan. Um, she came from Obali in County Galway. And she, she worked for the, she actually worked across the street for the, um, family across the street for the mansion for about 12 years. And then Sabina got married and she came over and worked for the Libbies. So I don't know if she's like, didn't like those people anymore or the Libbies were offering her more money. I don't know, but she just went right across the street and worked for them for another four years. Um, and 1928 was the last year that the Libbies lived at the mansion, so she stayed right till the end. Uh, this photograph is actually from her um, naturalization papers that I was able to find online on Ancestry. She is the only one of the servants who applied to be a citizen while she was living at the mansion. So this is her declaration to become a US citizen. And it says that her occupation is housework and that she lives at 109 Danforth Street. So if we had any question whether or not she was living at the mansion, she just spelled it right out for us. So that was very, it was nice she left us a picture and that she told us where she was living. It's also helpful, we know she has a birthmark on her left arm, you know? Just, it just makes people more human. All right, so also working with Catherine at the same time was Bridie Moran. And she was from a town called Belle Claire in County Galway. And I don't know if you noticed that I haven't changed the picture of the map. <laughs> so we have um, folks from Glen Fascia, we have folks from Belle Claire, and we have a lady from Oberly. Uh They were all the same church parish. Townships in Ireland are pretty small. Uh, for an equivalent, if I said West Cumberland, Cumberland Center, and Cumberland, and, uh, Cumberland Foreside were townships, that would be about the size we're talking. So basically, these three ladies, uh, uh, well, five ladies I think we're up to now, all went to, um, probably went to church together, or their families did, or they knew each other. That is another aspect of chi chain migration, is the same people come. You know, once one comes, okay, I know somebody there, I'm going to go meet the next person there. And if, you know, if Katie Steed's one sister comes here, they're all going to come here. They're not going to suddenly go, oh, I'm going to go to Minneapolis. They don't know anybody in Minneapolis. They're going to stick here in Portland. Um, so Hannah had mentioned Karna. Karna is right in here. And, um, on Spittle is in here, so they're both, that's one area she mentioned. But in this case, we've got a lot of people just outside the city of Toome that have come and particularly are working uh, at Victoria Mansion. Um, Bridie only worked uh, at the mansion for a year. Uh, she ended up going to work for um, the family who um, started WCSH, then radio. So she moved out to Cape Elizabeth and lived in a beautiful house out there, and then she got married and uh, moved to Massachusetts. Um, continued working as a servant down in Massachusetts. She has, uh, her house is still standing. Um, it's a beautiful house. Her house, the house the maid bought is actually on the historic register uh, down in Andover, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful, it's a little house, but it's a beautiful little Greek revival house. Um, so there's Bridie. So a neat thing about all of the people that I've showed you, um, I talked about how we looked backwards looking to see where they came from, the relationships of relatives who came, how they ended up here. Um, these three wonderful, amazing ladies who I just get goosebumps just talking about them. Um, these are Hannah Shine's granddaughters. So in addition to going backwards, we look forward to find living descendants. Um, all of the ladies that I've shown you today, we've found living descendants for. Um, and all of them, except for Bridie's granddaughter, um, have visited the mansion. So um, it's, it's a very special thing. Um, these, like I said, these three ladies, um, Hannah Shine was the first person that we were able to find the relatives for. Um, and a lot of work gets done out of obituaries. You know, it says who the next living kin is. Um, their brother, uh, their last names are Sullivan. They're, they're really common last names. So I'm like, how am I going to find these people? And the, their mother died in, I think, North Carolina. I'm like, how am I going to find these people? Thank goodness their brother's wife has a hyphenated last name that is two unusual last names. <laughs> so I was able to find her. So wrote to, wrote to him, and uh, he got me in contact. Um, Teresa with the black sweater in the front here um, lives in Scarborough. The other two live in North Carolina. Um, I sent an email to Teresa, and I said, this is during the pan tail end of the pandemic, tail end of the pandemic, when we, we were venturing out but not far. 
and I sent her an email and I said, if you are comfortable and you know you feel okay going to visit people, you could come to Maine Irish Heritage Center. There's no other people there. Hannah and I will wear masks. You know, everything's fine, but we'd love to meet you. Um, and she answered in about five minutes and she said, I'll be there tomorrow morning. Um, and I, we went and opened the door and she hugged both of us. I'm like, okay, that's the relationship. That's a relationship we still have. So. Um, they were so thrilled that somebody wanted to hear about their grandmother. Um, their grandmother had died before they were born, but they'd heard a lot from, about her from their mother, uh, their mothers, their cousins. So they are the ones who gave us the pictures of Hannah Schein. They're the ones who gave us the pictures of Katie Steed, because Katie and Hannah were best buds. Um, and the other thing that they did is there's a rolling pin, a um, darning egg, knitting needles, and a tape measure in this display case of Victoria Mansion. Um, we didn't have any servant items at Victoria Mansion. Our collection policy says that we will collect things that belonged to um, Ruggles and Olive Morse and J.R. and Louisa Libby. And I called the director and I said, what's the, what's the odds of tweaking that a little bit? <laughs> and he's like, oh yes. <laughs> so those things that had belonged to Hannah Shine, those are the first servant items that we have um, in the Victoria Mansion collection. And we're just a little bit excited about that. So <laughs> they've been very generous. They've given us the, the world famous Hannah Shine brownie recipe that we break out every once in a while. Um, but just a lot of good information. I had, I, I had found a bunch of information about Hannah, but they filled in a lot of gaps. In the pictures, I don't even know how many, they've given us three dozen pictures or, I mean, amazing pictures to have. So we're very excited. So, um, and like I said, all of the other folks. Um, the other servants that we mentioned, we've either met the great nieces or great nephews, other grandchildren. Just been a, very helpful filling out the story of servants at Victoria Mansion. It's not something that we used to talk a lot about just because there was so much to talk about with the other two people. And we're like, well, why can't we talk about the servants? Because that's fun too. So now at Victoria Mansion in the last year, so those of you who have been but not been recently, I know Madame has been recently because I took her grandson's stuffed animal on a sleepover there. But um, we have a special room now at Victoria Mansion that was not a servant's room. The, ser the actual servant spaces at Victoria Mansion are offices. Um, you don't want to go in and see my boss typing on his computer. But this room we've designated as a servant's display space now. So there's a lot of information about all of the people we found. They were not all Irish. That's a qu good question um, you often get. Um, they were not all Irish. Most of them were. But it lists all the ones that we found, everything we've got about them, um, photographs of different ones, and just opens people up to thinking about there's this beautiful house. Um, what did it take to run this house? Because we look at all the beautiful furniture. Somebody had to dust all that furniture. Somebody still does. There's one person who does it now. She's amazing. Um, we have a picture that we show that is um, Thanksgiving with the entire extended Libby family at the, di at the uh, dining room table for Thanksgiving. Somebody had to cook all that food. It's nice to be able to talk about that part of the story as well. Um, so the Portland Bridget Project kind of sprung as an extension of doing all of this work um, for Victoria Mansion. Um, Hannah and I basically were just having so much fun, we just wanted to keep going. We wanted more. <laughs> we just wanted more. Um, it, they're amazing stories. You hear the stories of these women and the adversity they overcame. Um, I didn't mention Hannah Shine got married um, moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, she lived in, she got married in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1917. Um, if you know anything about the flu pandemic, it started pretty much at, at Fort Devens, which is right up the road. Um, her husband died within a year of their being married and left her with a young infant. Um, she moved back to Portland. Um, Nellie and Danny, uh, Danny's her uh, brother-in-law, took care of her. Um, she eventually got remarried, but just looking at the adversity that these people overcome. So, we founded the Portland Bridget Project, like I said, which is our own private research group. It's not Victoria Mansion, it's not Maine Irish, although both groups are very supportive of it. Um, and we're just keeping, look, we're keeping on looking for more stories. Um, we put out uh, a shout out last year asking folks if they have a parent or a grandparent who was an Irish immigrant woman who had worked downtown, uh, excuse me, worked in Portland, you know, to give us a shout. So we got all sorts of people with like little tiny bits of stories that were really fun to put together. So that's, that's something we try to do for them. Um, we have presented now, we presented at the Maine uh, Archives and Museum Association Conference. We presented at the New England Museum Association Conference. Um, I have taught one class at OLLI, the Osher Lifelong, Lifelong Learning Institute at USM. I'm actually teaching another one next month. 
the interest in this is pretty amazing. That this is just kind of like our little pet project, and everyone's like, we want to hear about it. And you guys, too, so thanks for inviting us. Um, we don't know where it's going from here. Um, we would like to expand the servant's uh, display at Victoria Mansion. And like I said, we're interested in more than just Victoria Mansion, but where else are we going to display stuff? And the, the leadership at Victoria Mansion is very uh, open to letting us do that. So that's our, that's our story. Anyone have any questions? In the back, yes. Yep. 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 So, like I said, they and and this is true of each of the um, the descendants and stuff that I've that we've run across. Um, the the Shine granddaughters, like I said, I had I had the skeleton information, like this is where she was born. You know, this is this. They filled in things like. Um, her father was a carpenter and that they owned a, a store. They actually have relatives still that live in Ireland. I'm very jealous because all of mine came over here. Um, so they have been back and met with the, with the Shine relatives who still live there. So they, they, they kind of filled it out. Like we had the skeleton and they put the meat on it. it was, and the photos. The photos were amazing. Incredible resource. Yeah. yeah. We, we had, like I said, we had Sabina Grady's photo on the front steps and we had um, the Catherine Cullinan picture. Um, that was out of the off her naturalization record, but all of the other photographs you saw were given by a descendant. Uh, Bridie Moran's son is actually still alive. Bridie Moran just died in two thousand. Not just, but <laughs> in two thousand and three. Okay, it's, it was just you know, you know, you were a child, but <laughs> was it was like, a, a while ago. I was little. <laughs> you were little, um, but it's just it, it's amazing that we're that close to them. But her son is still alive, and her son did fill in some information as well. Yep. They all, uh, these particular ones all came through, Port, uh, excuse me, through Boston. Um, you always hear about um, people going to Ellis Island. None of these women went to Ellis Island. Um, there were some people who came into Portland who went to New York first. Um, and eventually, I think after like 1900, you could sail directly from Ireland into Portland. There, uh, House Island was an immigration station, so. Yeah. Yep. We don't know. <laughs> Um, there is one, one record that I have that um, the Libby's oldest granddaughter was interviewed, oral interviews, um, by a group in the 1980s that we re recently refound. She says that Sabina made, I think, five or six dollars a week and they bought her uniform. Um, and the only disclosure I would put on that is Sabina started working, and the granddaughter lived across the street. Um, Sabina started working there and the granddaughter was I think 12 so she would have been like 12 to 18 so maybe she did know what her grandparents paid their maid I'm not a hundred percent sure um, well as Hannah pointed out they're getting free room and board so anything they're making is yeah they don't they don't have to pay for that so yeah Kelly so I know that one of the first girl. yep first girl um, let's go back here. Yep. Um, so for, it says to do a cook to do cook and do general housework. So you have two. Pretty much your coachman or your chauffeur is a guy. Not pretty much your coachman or chauffeur is a guy. Um, so there's often two women in the house. Um, ideally, what they wanted. So Dr. Lynch Brennan told us they would ideally want a maid of all works. They want one girl who can do everything, but that's a lot. Um, so what you'd often see is there was a hierarchy. It was just a two-person hierarchy. Um, oftentimes, it was the cook who was the first girl. She was the one who was in charge. Um, and Sabina actually, um, Sabina was a second girl. So in, in the time frame that uh, 1916 to 1923, she has different, on one census, she's called a maid. On one, um, she's called a second girl. Here on the city directory, she's called a maid. On the back of this photograph, actually, she's called the cook. So. Um, you know, so I don't know if she got promoted <laughs> or just, you know, different, it depended on who you asked. Like Mr. Libby would say she's this, but Mrs. Libby said she was something else. So that, yep. Kathy. Oh, the great question. We didn't cover that. We did not All right. That. Well, let's cover that. So Thank Portland Bridget Project. Um, as Hannah was saying, people from Ireland in general uh, there was very negative stereotypes of them. You'd get uh, guys would get called Patty or Mick, no matter what their name was, and they didn't mean it as a compliment. Um, the same was true with Bridget. 
Uh, Bridget, of course, is a very Irish name. And it ended up that Bridget ended up basically being slang for a housemaid. So you know you want you know you're going to blame the Bridget because she broke the dishes, or you need to hire a new Bridget. Didn't matter what their names were; they're just going to call you Bridget. Um, you got a lot of people in this time frame changing their names from Bridget. Um, whoops, that isn't what I wanted to do. Um, so true. Um, Bridie's name was actually Bridget when she came over. When she was naturalized, where's Bridie? Where's our buddy Bridie? Bridie. Um, she was born Bridget. When she came over um, and when she was naturalized, she legally changed her name on her naturalization records to Bridie because there was such a negative uh, connotation around Bridie. Um, I have a great aunt who came over who was Bridget, and I couldn't find her on any of the records. Uh, like, she came to Boston, and then she disappeared. Um, and then Matt, our colleague at Maine Irish, told me to look for Delia. I'm like, why the heck am I going to look for Delia from Bridget? Um, Bridget, is, uh, Bridget in Latin is Bedelia. So some women named Bridget went to uh, Delia, and I did find her as Delia. And then I was like, oh, it's Aunt Dee. Now, now that I know, that's what it is. Um, and just a, just a little sidebar there. So um, if Bridget is Bedelia, Kathy Harper, who's a famous Bedelia in children's literature? Amelia Bedelia. Amelia Bedelia. So if you start thinking of Amelia Bedelia, who can't get any of the um, sayings, who tells you to draw the drapes, and she sketches a picture of the window, um, dress the chicken, and she puts clothes on the chicken. Um, I do not have proof of this, but once I knew that Bridget and Bedelia were the same name, it's, you start thinking about maybe that's someone who doesn't understand English. And historically, you see a lot of like a lot of those little comics right. about Irish maids, the Irish Bridgets. Right, that they're not they're not they're very understanding. Similar. Right, they're not understanding what I'm telling them to do. Um, so is that a connection? I don't know. But I look at Amelia Bedelia a little bit differently now. <laughs> Um, yeah, was, she, was she an Irish woman who didn't understand English? Right, yes, right. So, so back to your question of why we named it the Bridget Project. Um, Bridget is the matron saint of Ireland. Um, she is also a very important uh, Celtic goddess. She's a pretty big deal in Ireland. So to us, if we're going to talk about these people, we're taking back the name Bridget. So that's why we, we named this the Portland Bridget Project. Um, and if you notice, the, the uh, lady is cleaning up the name. <laughs> so, so we're, we're giving Bridget reclaiming back it. her due. We're reclaiming it, absolutely. So, and for those of you who knew my daughter, no, my daughter, she drew the logo for us. <laughs> Any other questions? So you said you expanded it to any surgeons? Like any, any Irish, our, our goal is to um, learn about any Irish women who were servants in Portland. We, we would go wider, but then, you, you know, we have to narrow it down. So. so we do have a Facebook page, the Portland Bridget Project. Um, very conveniently, we do have connections with Maine Irish Heritage Center. And surprisingly, a lot of people there are Irish. So <laughs> um, the, word, the word tends to get out. There's, you know, one, one person hears Hannah or I start going off on this and like, what's going on? And then, oh, you know, right. Vinny, you want to hear about your mom who was a maid? Go talk to Michelle and Hannah. And it just kind of... <laughs> Word of mouth spreading around there. So, yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. I, I will throw out too if you're interested in the Maine Irish Heritage Center, we do have brochures about it. A lot of people don't even know it exists. Um, it's on the corner of State Street and Gray Street. So, uh, open Thursdays from 10 to 2 anyway, and you get to see Hannah there. We'd like to take a tour. And if anyone's interested in visiting the Maine Irish Heritage Center on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. doesn't work, do not hesitate to reach out to us and we can set up another time. And very conveniently, we have business cards. Is we do. It's like a church. Yeah, so it was the former. We are in the process of getting more displays up. There, there is a display. Yes. Um, and of course, the building itself is a display. We have a fabulous library. Um, which is, I, I, I don't think we're bragging saying this, it's, it's probably the best Irish library north of Boston as far as the volumes that they have there. Over 5,000 books related to Irish, Irish everything. everything. Yeah. We also have a fabulous genealogy department that uh, they're like 
grand slam home run genealogists. Incredible work. Um, and in, in addition to manipulating ancestry and a hundred other records, uh, record formats that I don't even know about, um, they also um, are doing a DNA project. They have gone to Ireland and taken DNA of folks there and you know, not with their permission, not, <laughs> not like, yes. they're like stealing their toothbrush or something. They're, everybody's in on everybody's. this. And connecting them to um, people here in Portland or Boston or around there. Um, and they, they have an extensive network. They have an extensive network. They work closely with the um, center in Karna, um, which is in Galway. Um, so they've done a lot of really great work with that. And, and my personal comment that when I first walked into Maine Irish Heritage Center, <laughs> one of the genius genealogists looked at me and she goes, you don't have to tell me your name, you have Mulkern eyes. And I'm like, I got no Mulkern. I don't know where you're getting, and she went on for years about this. Every time mm -hmm. I'd go in, like, there's Michelle with her Mulkern eyes. We have a Portland High School yearbook. She pulled out somebody's, some, I don't know, somebody Mulkern. And it looked like my mother, which those of you who know my mom, my mom is not the Irish one. Um, <laughs> So Maureen went on this for a couple years, and then at one point I was going a few steps further back in my genealogy, and guess what? They were Mulkerns, who apparently have strong genes for their eyes. But I mean, yes. the genealogists there are amazing. Incredible. So there's lots of stuff, Dave. It's not we're working on exhibits, but there's other. There's concerts. Too. There's, all, there's there concerts. Are, there's yes. a uh, there's poetry reading coming up. Yes, April 13th. You're the expert on the events. She's the one who works there. <laughs> yes, we've got, let me see, we've got April 13th, uh, the poetry reading. Um, we have some three great poets from Maine um, who will be reading their work. And then... There's a concert. There's a concert with Celtic Thunder's Neil Byrne. Yeah, that's coming. Which I, w I have to check up the date on that. It's all on our website. It's all on the website, yes. Flyer, so. Mainirish.com. Or give us a call. Yeah. You'll get Hannah. You will get me. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, I want a treat. Take your mic off. <laughs>